Thank you very much. All right, so we set out uh, in this study is to use uh, big data transcriptomic profiling uh, to look at changes in skeletal muscle following sonication by either pulse-focused ultrasound or uh, therapeutic ultrasound. This is low-intensity linear ultrasound. Now, we've been studying the bioeffects of ultrasound in muscle for a number of years, and we have pretty pr uh, thorough proteomic profiles of each. Uh, but the downside to this is this is tedious and takes a long time. So we were looking at this as an alternative for a sort of high throughput analysis that we could use to understand the bioeffects of ultrasound and ultimately with the goal of properly imp implementing ultrasound modalities in the clinic. Uh, so just a little background on the experiment. The setup is but fairly simple, we give either non-ablative pulse-focused ultrasound without microbubbles or lipus to uh, murine hamstrings, and then we, uh, we can harvest the hamstrings at various time points and we perform RNA-seq. I will describe a little bit about the effects of each of the ultrasound modalities. So for pulse-focused ultrasound, uh, the consequence is relatively moderate acoustic radiation forces, and we've done uh, finite element analysis modeling showing uh, both axial and lateral stresses in the tissue, and we also detect harmonic emissions suggesting stable cavitation uh, following formation, bubble formation of dissolved tissue gases. And we, with post-focused ultrasound, we don't generate substantial heating in the focal zone. Now, lipus, on the other hand, is a minimal acoustic radiation force, there's no cavitation, however, we do produce about a five degree uh, C increase in the tissue temperature. Our RNA-seq methods are pretty standard. Uh, we'll say for differential expression, we use ANOVA. Uh, that's because we want to look at time and treatment as factors. So looking at the data here, we see that at each time point with each modality, a number of genes go up and down compared to unsonicated muscle, and that we can do hierarchical clustering to show that there are temporal relationships to these gene changes. And one of the things we want to look at is to compare the two modalities, and we can see in the Venn diagrams in the middle that there's some overlap in the gene changes, but that the majority of the changes are unique to each modality. And one side point that I want to make is that if you look at, say, pulse-focused ultrasound at the 24-hour, for example, this is one total second of sonication in the muscle, and at 24 hours, nearly 20% of the transcriptome is still different. So I think that RNA-seq is a tool that allows you to easily appreciate the level and the breadth of biology going on here that really we're excited to look at. Uh, so to try to make sense of some of this data, we can do pathway enrichment analyses. And what I'm showing you here is to take significantly enriched pathways for each modality, and then we did an ANOVA to compare them uh, for differential uh, or directional enrichment. So what we're looking at are pathways that are the most different between pulse-focused ultrasound and lipus. And the very first thing we see is FOXO signaling. So FOXO is a family of transcription factors that mediate uh, autophagy, which is the process by which cells degrade and recycle proteins. And I will we can look a little more in depth at these pathways here, and I won't get into this too much, but just to say that when we look at how each of the participants in these pathways are altered by ultrasound, we see that pulse-focused ultrasound in yellow tends to upregulate th things that drive FOXO and drive autophagy, while lipus tends to upregulate the inhibitors of these processes. So depending on which ultrasound modality you, you choose, you can drive autophagy in one direction or another. And the pathological relevance to this is that in skeletal muscle, normal muscle function requires an appropriate level of autophagy. That if it becomes dysregulated in either direction, the result is necrotic myopathy and muscle loss. And different diseases induce this pathology by altering autophagy in different ways. And so our RNA-seq data beg the question is, can we use different modalities to appropriately alter autophagy and hopefully prevent muscle loss and uh, muscle weakness? And so that is sort of a plug for what I hope will be my talk in 2020 here. Um, and to wrap up is uh, that by RNA-seq, we see large-scale genetic changes in tissue following ultrasound. and this hopefully can be used to 
guide research and direct research before having to, to take on uh, painstaking proteomic studies. And we also want to move into other tissue types and always with the goal of best implementing ultrasound modalities uh, for the treatment of diseases. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank Joe Frank and the rest of my lab. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. I can't resist asking a provocative question. Have you tried it on diagnostic ultrasound? And especially in the context of uh, pregnancy, ultrasound screening during pregnancy. No, we've not, but I would expect numerous changes there that, again, are, are widely unappreciated. I'd appreciate 2020 or before. You okay. <laughs> thank you. Hi. Thank you very much for your talk. I was just wondering if you looked at the effect of hyperthermia alone on any of these changes that you observed. Uh, so it's interesting. We've done a lot of work showing that, so for example, the lipus, we can treat skeletal muscle that has implanted mesenchymal stem cells, and we show lots of molecular changes that uh, prolong the lifetimes of those stem cells. And while heat is critical, it is also requires the mechanical forces for as small as they are, that if you just look at heating, you don't see as wide-scale changes. Okay, so you think that. That if you but we didn't do RNA-seq on just heating. Okay, but if you were to do, let's say, RNA-seq with like heating in a water bath, you would not expect to see the same results? Uh, what? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, we didn't. We, we saw completely different proteomic responses using just heat to the same temperature as using lipus with small acoustic radiation forces. Thank yes. I just a very very nice presentation. Oh, thank you. A little bit too crowded for me, but that's good. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to make a comment about the uh, diagnostic ultrasound. The MI came because of this reason. And uh, Christy Holland published a few articles on diagnostic ultrasound and the probability of cavitation bubbles. So, but as far as we know, uh, there is no proven evidence of the diagnostic ultrasound damaging fetal aspect. So we have to be very careful about this. Sure, sure. And, and Naren, I think it's it, it, maybe not necessarily about damaging, but our lipus, for example, is about 10 times, the MI is about 10 times less than what the FDA limit would be. And I, I think it just goes to point that there's still a lot of biology going on here. And it's not to say that it, it's deleterious or creates safety issues per se, uh, but that there's a lot more going on than I think we are, are, are quick to recognize. Very nice work, thank you. Uh, uh, any, any insights into sarcoma uh, therapy? No, no. Uh, <laughs> not at all? No, okay. none yet. Into any kind of chemo delivery? No, no we, ha we have not moved into tumors in the, in the muscle okay. or anything. So. Great work. Okay, Thanks. thank you very much.